Hi everyone, and welcome back. Over the past couple lessons, we've learned how to do something truly remarkable in mathematics. We've learned how to extend our notion of linear approximation to approximate a complicated function using not just a line, not just a parabola, not just a cubic, but in general, a polynomial of degree n, which we refer to as the Taylor polynomial centered at the point of approximation x0. We've derived a formula to help us find these polynomials, and we've learned some tricks to make the computations a little bit easier. But one thing that we haven't yet asked is, how good is this approximation? How close are f of x and the Taylor polynomial pn x0? That is, how big is this error term, the difference between these two expressions in absolute value? Well, it turns out that quantifying this difference exactly is an incredibly difficult task because we could be dealing with very, very complicated functions. So rather than trying to determine the exact value of this error, we're going to settle for an upper bound, some number where we can say, okay, the error is definitely less than this. This upper bound will be given to us in our next lesson in the form of a very famous theorem called Taylor's inequality. In order to get there, though, we need a stepping stone, an intermediate result called Taylor's remainder theorem, which allows us to express this difference, this error term, in a much more tractable form. With this in mind, the goal of our lesson is to state and justify Taylor's remainder theorem. We're only going to have one video lesson on this topic, just an overview. There's no need for an example video because we won't be doing problems that involve the remainder theorem. This is just a stepping stone for us to get to Taylor's inequality, and we will be doing lots of examples with that. So with this in mind, just sit back, relax, and enjoy the math. It's not often that you get to see something that you're not tested on. Okay, so we're faced with the difficult task of understanding the difference between our function f of x and its nth order Taylor polynomial p n x naught. Well, in mathematics, when you're faced with a difficult task, it's often helpful to start with the simplest case. Here, our simplest case will occur when p n x naught is just a constant. It doesn't get much simpler than that, right? In this case, we're measuring the difference between f of x and the zeroth order Taylor polynomial p zero x naught. To find p0 x0, we're going to plug n equals 0 into our formula. We're just going to get the constant term f of x0. So we're measuring the difference between f of x and f of x0. From here, there isn't a whole lot that we can do with this expression, but we could write it as a single term using the fundamental theorem of calculus. By the FTC, this difference is the same as the integral from x0 to x of f prime t dt. Here t is just a dummy variable that we're using to write our integral. But if you evaluate the integral on the right, I think you should exactly get the expression on the left. Now although this expression looks more complicated than the difference we started with, it turns out that writing the error as an integral like this is exactly what we're going to need in the next lesson to use Taylor's inequality. We'll now show that the difference between f of x and its linear approximation, p1 x0, can be written in much the same form. Our next task will be to understand the difference between f of x and its linear approximation p1 x0. I've rewritten that linear approximation using my Taylor polynomial formula. I can write it as f of x0 plus f prime x0 times x minus x0. Now if you look at this expression for a moment, you might see something familiar. We have the difference of f of x and f of x0. That's exactly the difference that we had on the previous slide. The difference that we rewrote is the integral from x0 to x of f prime t dt. What's left over is minus f prime x0 times x minus x0. Now my goal, just like on the previous slide, is to rewrite this as a single term to make it as simple as possible. The trick here is to use integration by parts to rewrite your integral. When you do this, you'll introduce some new terms that kill off some of the garbage hanging out at the back. This will simplify the expression overall. So using integration by parts, I'm going to let u, the function I'm differentiating, be f prime of t, and I'm going to let dv be whatever's left over. In this case, it's just dt. So my du term is f double prime t dt, and my v term is just t. Okay, so using integration by parts, I can rewrite my expression as uv, which is t f prime t, evaluated from x0 to x, minus the integral of v du, which in this case is t f double prime t, 
dt. And of course, I still have my garbage term f prime x naught times x minus x naught. Now notice the magic here. When I sub in these bounds, I'm going to end up killing off part of this garbage term at the end. In particular, when I sub in x naught, I have f prime x naught times x naught. And here, I have f prime x naught times x naught. Those two terms are going to kill each other. So I get to throw that out, and I get to throw that out. And what's left is x times f prime x. That's what I get from my upper bound, minus x f prime x naught. That's from my garbage term. And then, of course, I still have this gross integral. So if I put it all together, what I'm left with is x times f prime x minus f prime x naught minus this integral from x naught to x of t f double prime t dt. Now, just like on the last slide, I could rewrite this term as an integral. I could write it as x times the integral from x naught to x of f double prime t dt. This is from my fundamental theorem of calculus. And of course, I still have the other integral of t f double prime t dt. I'm allowed to pull this x term inside the integral, because after all, this is an integral with respect to t. In doing so, I get the single expression given by the integral from x naught to x of x minus t f double prime t dt. Now it looks complicated, but the important thing here is that we've managed to rewrite this difference as a single integral term, just like we were able to do on the previous slide with f of x and its constant approximation. This is exactly what we're going to need for Taylor's inequality. Let's see if we can do it one more time using the error in our quadratic approximation. If we can do that, I think you'll start to see the general pattern that's emerging here. Okay, so once again, it's our goal to simplify this error term, the difference between f of x and now its quadratic approximation p2x0. Notice that the quadratic approximation is really the linear approximation with one more term, the degree 2 term. The reason I'm separating it like this is because we know something about the linear approximation from the previous slide. We know that it can be written in the form integral from x0 to x of x minus t f double prime t dt. And then I have this garbage term f double prime x0 times x minus x0 squared divided by 2. Just like before, I'm going to use integration by parts to rewrite this integral. I'll set u equal to f double prime t, so du is f triple prime t dt, and I'll let dv be the piece that's left over. In this case, dv is going to be x minus t dt. When I integrate with respect to t, I find that v is minus x minus t squared divided by 2. Okay, so using my integration by parts, I'm going to rewrite this integral. I get uv, which in this case is minus x minus t squared over 2, f double prime t, evaluated from x naught to x, minus the integral of v du. But notice that the v has a minus as well. So I'm going to change this to a plus and write this as the integral from x naught to x of v du. So x minus t squared f triple prime t divided by 2 dt. And of course, I still have this extra term, f double prime x naught, x minus x naught squared divided by 2. Now, here's the magic one more time. When I sub in these bounds, I'm going to clean up this garbage term. When I sub in my upper bound, this entire expression goes away, right? It becomes 0. When I sub in my lower bound of x naught, I get x minus x naught squared over 2 times f double prime x naught. Look familiar? It's exactly the term we have over here. So I can throw out these entire expressions, and I'm just left with one integral expression, the integral from x0 to x of x minus t squared f triple prime t divided by 2 dt. Okay, now hopefully you're starting to see a pattern here. Go back to the previous slides where we computed the error term for our constant and linear approximations and compare them with what we're getting here for quadratic. You'll see that in every case, we're getting some integral from x naught to x. The powers of x minus t are increasing. We're getting higher order derivatives of our function. And you might have guessed that we're dividing by our factorial numbers, one factorial, two factorial, and so on. 
So I'm going to take the pattern that we've observed in the first few cases, and I'm going to summarize it in the big theorem for this lesson, Taylor's Remainder Theorem. All right, folks, it's been a bit of a journey, but we've made it to the end. We're now ready to state the main result of this lesson, Taylor's Remainder Theorem. It says that if your function f of x has n plus 1 derivatives at x0, meaning the first n plus 1 derivatives exist at this point, then the function f can be written as this crazy sum, which you'll likely recognize as the nth order Taylor approximation for the function, plus something left over, a remainder term or an error term. That error can be written as an integral, the integral from x0 to x of x minus t to the n divided by n factorial times the n plus first derivative of f at t. Unfortunately, we can't actually evaluate this integral. It's just not possible. So we might not know the error term exactly, but as you'll see in the next lesson, we're going to use this integral to obtain an upper bound on the error term. This result, known as Taylor's inequality, will tell us how close this polynomial approximation is to the values of our function.